Um, we had two uh, guys travel in from the West Coast and the East Coast. Well, Nick is a third coaster right here in Austin, Texas. Um, if you do meetups and ended up at Rackspace, I've seen Nick there almost every time I've gone, and always lots of insightful information and contributions from Nick. So I'm super excited to hear what he has to say today. Um, also, where, where was your first job, Nick? Right here. Uh, they, they tore it down, but I actually started out as a junior sysadmin working for electrical engineering, so about 10, 12 years ago as an undergrad. Uh, and, and he's back. And he's back. All right, Nick, here we go. You probably do remember me from those days, yeah. Awesome. So, so anyway, um, it's a pretty good intro. Uh, my, name's, my name's Nick Silkey. Um, I am actually um, an engineer uh, at Rackspace, Rackspace Austin. I sort of work in public cloud. Um, sort of where I'm going to go today is sort of take you on a journey of where I've been in the last year. Um, prior to this role that I'm currently in now, um, I used to work in a handful of other engineering roles within Rackspace. So um, I used to work for the Cloud Identity team. So when you want to talk about web ops at scale, that was an interesting ride. Um, I also worked for a team that processed basically every usage and billable event for all of Rackspace Cloud. So that was quite a trip too. Um, so what I've sort of come to find my passion is really working with sort of build and release engineering, right? I love enabling product teams to be able to ship you know, sort of accurately and quickly. That's really, really awesome, interesting work. So um, part and parcel with that comes some sort of uh, uh, infrastructure code, right, or, inf or infra code, which allows me to sort of recreate the business, manage the business, carry changes forward. Um, and along with that comes sort of this idea of sort of a high-functioning team. So I can sort of talk about what's a not high-functioning team to start with. Um, sort of when I first started, um, we sort of were working with sort of uh, Java artifacts, and it was a very typical devs know how the Maven build stuff works, and they dump out an artifact, and they put it somewhere, and it's your job to pick it up and go put it somewhere and pop a service. Um, we're no longer sort of where that is currently. Um, <laughs> so we started out reasonably segmented, reasonably dysfunctional in terms of roles being sort of separated, um, and lots of volume of work. Um, but sort of over time, um, there's been sort of a, a deliberate, iterative um, effort to sort of chip away at that culture. Uh, and really sort of transform where we are now versus where we are then. So um, while I don't think it's directly causal, I think it's reasonably influential. So some of the stuff that we've sort of done here that I think has been really, really helpful within the last year um, has been our team sort of working with communicating across the board um, through a tool called Slack. Everyone here is already on it. But I, and I think Nathan alluded to this a little bit. Um, it's been really awesome having sort of our product team our managers, QE, DevOps, it's not just Dev and Ops like Nathan was talking about. This is having everybody who's responsible for shipping the product sort of tuned in and having the same communication stream and the same experience that everyone else has. Um, a handful of other sort of bulleted lists of why we think this is sort of really, really important and helped our team sort of level up. Um, you know, mobile, playback, search, pinning, all those types of things sort of make it really, really slick to allow someone who is a true technical contributor to the team with sort of their, their sleeves rolled up uh, and know how to jockey the keyboard versus those that don't. That's really, really been awesome. Um, other stuff that I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk talks about um, utilizing tools like Slackbot and integrations to sort of make the team sort of really, really get stuff done quickly. Um, so IRC is a tool um, that we sort of use internally within Rackspace. It has sort of a lot of history there. Um, I've sort of given this talk internally at a couple of tech talks within Rackspace, and sort of one of the things I'll say there is, IRC is fine, and I think the takeaway for this audience here is that whatever you're using is fine as long as it sort of promotes those tenants I'm talking about here. One of the things you don't want to do is necessarily chase the shiny, because um, there's startup costs involved with that, right, and being able to sort of burn down how you used to do things and onboard everyone on how to do the new things, um, that, you know, that comes at a cost, right? You better, it better be willing to pay dividends if you're going to do it. Um, so one of the things that I think has really helped the team here has been um, what I like to call cross-team visibility for everything. Um, this isn't necessarily about uh, you sort of working through a storyboard through like Jira or anything like that in order to, for you to understand what's happening with the state of things in terms of the product being developed. Um, my team sort of shunts pretty much everything through webhooks. That way everyone can sort of have an understanding of where the business is at, right, or where the product's at, both in terms of what are we developing, right, what is sort of not on fire type stuff, where are we going with the product, um, but then also sort of what's the state of things in terms of um, is there an issue, right, sort of production issues. So um, all the sorts of typical product tooling that we use within the org, you know, um, GitHub, Jenkins, we make, take advantage of Chef and Ansible to do sort of both um, declarative configuration management and also imperative state orchestration. Um, New Relic, lots of these tools, when we can sort of roll that stuff up um, into sort of a webhook integrated method to allow everyone in the business or everyone in the product team to be able to see where things are at, 
that's really, really valuable at helping sort of break down where we used to be, where there were sort of real compartmentalized roles in the team. Um, another thing that you're probably going to hear quite a bit today, um, and not just necessarily from me, is talking about this concept of chat ops. Um, really, I think the, the real key takeaway here is just do what you do normally, but do it sort of in chat via tooling, right? So this idea of, I can understand what it means for a QE person to kick off a test suite if they can do it in public the way everyone can sort of see how to do it. So that you can keep that person's hit by bus number. It makes onboarding really, it keep, makes onboarding really simple. So it, it's a really, really great functional way for you to streamline the workflow of who's sort of doing what when. Um, the thing I'll say here is sort of pick, pick a bot and use it, right? It kind of doesn't really matter um, what you choose here. Um, it's all about sort of making some quick, quick wins here. Um, so you know, there's, if, if you're a Ruby shop, you, know, you can take advantage of, of Lita, which is written in Ruby. You can take advantage of Air, which is written in Python. There's Hubot, um, written in CoffeeScript. So there's lots and lots of stuff here that you can pick. Um, the cool thing here is that you can sort of take those webhooks that you already started to jump off with and sort of integrate them here. So um, my, team, my, team uses, my team uses Hubot in order to sort of manage Jenkins job orchestration, page duty events, new relic data. So it's a, it's a really, really great way for us to sort of read and write events um, in sort of this chat work stream. One of the other things that's been sort of really, really instrumental, I think, in sort of transforming how the, the team works here is that um, I've talked to a few people, and I've also been in that role where you sort of have a very bespoke Jenkins infrastructure that no one really knows sort of how it got set up that way, but it's sort of happened that way over time. And when it breaks, you better call Dick or Jane because they're the only ones who know how to fix it. Um, one of the things that's been really, really insightful um, within my team has been utilizing this tool called Jenkins Job Builder. So if you're a team who uses Jenkins and you're in that sort of first camp I talked about where there's lots of pain and suffering, um, I urge you to take a look at this, right? So we, ha we had that when I sort of first started the team. Um, what we've actually done over time, um, job build is really cool. It allows you to sort of build, manage complex job builds and Jenkins build flow as code, right? It ends up being YAML, but it allows me to have inheritance. I can have the sort of don't repeat yourself mantra. I have support for environments. Um, and it's OpenStack, so it's gotta be good, right? <laughs> so it's maintained upstream, it's used by the OpenStack infrastructure team to manage their crazy complex and large web scale CI infrastructure. Um, we use it as a product team at Rackspace to sort of manage our CI infrastructure. So it's really, really cool. Um, talking about some mechanisms of how we do that, because I've had some people ask me, like, well, show me how the sausage is really made, right? Um, so what we actually do, we, we have some, some continuous integration infrastructure that runs, it's managed by Chef. Um, what we actually do, so we have a code repository that maintains all this YAML. Um, we have sort of cron resources that are responsible for grabbing master off of that on a cadence, um, laying down sort of a known good config and removing the old config. What that means is that during that job builder runtime, I can do a couple of things. I can say, whatever was there, wipe it. I want you to manage this exact state that I've declared in this YAML. So if there's a job that's gone out of sync, right, wipe it. If there's a job that's not managed there, wipe it. So it allows me to maintain this clean room within CI, um, which is really, really awesome. Um, one of the things this also lets me do is to make it really, really trivial for a team to sort of onboard this. Um, so when we have new members of the team, let's see if I can do this. All right, so um, I've got a bunch of information here, right? Um, I've got all my, different, all my different YAML in there that describes all the different CI infrastructure that we run here. And what I can actually do, um, one of the things I'll talk about a little bit later is that we love the make files, right? They're a really, really great way for me to provide sort of sufficient guard railing around what it is that a person intends to do when they engage with code, right? So what I can actually do here is when I have a new person join the team, right, they can simply clone this repository, call a make file target, and in the end, this is gonna build the necessary Jenkins infrastructure within Docker, shove my YAML into it, and allow a developer, QE, ops, whoever it is that wants to sort of engage with the CI right there. So there's no, there's no magic to it, right? Everyone can sort of see how production is sort of actually managed here. And so when you, make, when you take the mystery out of CI, it allows anyone on the product team to engage and keep that stuff up to date and make it really high functioning, right? So what I'm actually doing here is it's, ramp, it's shoved a bunch of YAML within to um, my instance. If I jump in here, it's rendering a bunch of jobs for me. This was sort of a clean room of Jenkins. If I take a look, as, it, as the Python does its needful, right, like it's dumping out my jobs for me. And this is a bit for bit, this is how production runs, right? And so this is really, really rad to allow people who say, it'd be great if CI did something differently. 
I've removed sort of those barriers to entry to make it really, really trivial for someone to engage on that, and that's really cool. Um, so um, yeah, the only other thing we sort of do here that's really special or different is that if we have anything that runs on a timer, we just swizzle that off, and that's about the only difference between how production really runs and how like the person's ephemeral doc, for instance, and their container runs. Um, the other thing we do too, in the event that you need to run something that needs to maybe receive a webhook, right? If you're working from the office and you're behind the, a big firewall or whatever, um, really by me just specifying, by me just specifying uh, an environment variable to my make target, I can just say, oh, by the way, Docker machine, go build this in Rackspace Public Cloud, please. Um, so by making things really reasonably extensible and making things really trivial for people to onboard whatever it is they intend to do, um, that's, really, that's really helpful and awesome. The other thing that we've done too over time is that as we've made it easy for people to bring jobs to CI, um, they brought lots of jobs to CI, right? There's lots and lots of stuff there. One of the other things that my team has sort of onboarded recently too, um, if you've ever used Jenkins over time, there's lots of jobs, you can construct views. There's a similar Python-based software product out there, that uh, open source software product that attempts to do the same thing with Jenkins views as job builder. So what we've actually done is onboarded here this function for us to sort of categorize via regexes, which are really, really simple for me to have laid out for me in uh, job builder YAML. And so I can make it really trivial for anyone to want to try to go take a peek at what sort of what state it is that you know, runs the thing, right? So, um, so yeah. We're back, all right. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important to help level your team up sort of in an iterative state is um, being able to share monitoring comms, right? One of the things that's the worst is when like the ops guy or girl is the only one who knows when stuff's on fire. And that's that one, that makes things really, really difficult for your developers to even sort of care, engage, empathize with sort of what it means. But then two, it makes it really hard for you to get to that state where you eventually want to burden share, right? People talk about how they want to have really high functioning product teams that are sort of that, that are sort of responsible for maintaining the you know, sort of the uptime, the availability, and landing of features within their product team. You can't really do that if you're like the one or two ops people or persons who know when stuff's, stuff's on fire. So um, giving team visibility into alerts is a really, really critical thing, I think, to help at the very least start that process. Even if it's not actionable, even though your devs don't necessarily have to go on call, this idea of like, hey, now you can see what it's like when you know, sort of stuff lights up. Um, that's really, 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 really cool. So it allows everyone to sort of be aware. The other thing that's cool about that too is if you have that single work stream to shunt that stuff into, now leadership has visibility into that state, right? You being able to have leadership be aware that something's on fire, it no longer becomes a push-based technology leadership can pull from that and not take cycles from you as an operator who's working to restore service, right? Um, so PagerDuty, New Relic, webhook, webhooks, all that stuff really, really helps. Um, the other thing that's sort of really cool here um, is that it sort of lets you know what failed when. Like as you sort of start to tweak this to where it's not sort of an arbitrary check that fails on you, um, you can provide a much more descriptive story in chat with timestamps to let you know when things failed and maybe when things restored to service. And I'll talk a little bit more about managing incidents in a minute. Um, the other thing is that as an operator, you really want to do whatever you can do to help make your monitoring pluggable. And what that means is that do whatever you can do to make it trivial for a developer to add new monitoring functions or features, uh, functions as they land features, right? If a developer put, you know, pushes code that is a feature addition, you should be able to make it really easy for them to be able to bring the necessary monitoring or hooks into whatever it is that they attempt to monitor with the, the feature they just pushed. Um, the same thing's true with the trending framework, right? If you make it really, really hard for someone to send counters or gauges upstream to your time series data store, they're not gonna do it. And so, um, by you sort of being deliberate in the choices that you choose to spend uh, your time hydrating a time series data store infrastructure up for trending, um, do that in a way that makes it really easy for anyone to want to choose to opt into. Um, so yeah, um, the other thing too is that uh, while, I, while I went to sort of go grab water at the main track, someone said like, what's the, what's the best way to monitor, right? Everyone starts out with sort of these really trivial monitors, but in the end, it all boils down to sort of what the clients are really actually doing. <laughs> So the other thing I'll say too is that make it, try to make it as easy as you can for that developer, that QE person, or even yourself as the operator to bring a real holistic synthetic check of what it means to exercise the function that your clients are actually doing, right? Um, I already shared a little bit of love about this earlier, but um, what's really, really important here, I think, is this idea of rubbing a make file on everything. Um, it, it actually is a really great way um, to allow you to, one, what you do sort of works everywhere. 
right? You don't make any sort of necessary assumptions about what runtime or what state might actually be on the machine that's running the thing, whether it's CI that's doing it, a dev's work laptop, a dev's laptop that's OSX, a dev's laptop that's Linux, whatever. Um, this is a really sort of technically democratic way to allow someone to do the thing they intend to do. Um, so what we have learned is that there's been some subtle differences between um, uh, GNU make and BSD make, but don't let that scare you from, <laughs> you know, sort of as you get more sophisticated in what it is you intend to do through, through these make files, um, don't let that be a reason why you should, you know, stop doing this because it's really, really good. Um, to just reiterate what I, my pitch for make files, whenever people say, what, make files, really? I say it, it, it really does a good job of providing that sufficient guard railing for what it is you intend to do, right? And that's the really, really big takeaway here. Um, some really cool stuff that you can do here is that you can put that checking or that gating around, maybe you expect there to be some environment variables set in a way that's explicit for you to do a function, right? Whereas if that stuff's not set or set in the wrong way, that you could blow stuff up, right? Or you could make things at least behave in a way that's unintended, right? And so being able to check for the state of environment variables through your make target, um, that's reasonably trivial to do. Some stuff that we've done here, um, I talked about how my team uses a combination of Ansible and Chef in order to do, do what's necessary. Um, one of the things we actually do, right, with, with Ansible, when you intend to do a thing, one of the things you probably wanna do before you do it is maybe validate your scope, right? Or maybe you want to run it in a way that's sort of a dry run. You wanna diff it, you wanna check it, but you don't wanna actually do it to make sure you're do, you've got everything sort of set up the way you intend to do it. With the makefile approach, you can actually make it reasonably trivial to bring the equivalent of a feature flag to your make target to say, oh, by the way, run this in debug. Oh, hey, by the way, run this, you know, with, with, you know, check true. Oh, by the way, you know, sort of run this and don't run it, but just dump out my list of hosts to validate that my scope is the way it intends to do. Um, when you do that, then people aren't sort of scared to engage with everything that drives how you deploy to production, right? De when developers or QE can do that, when they didn't write this stuff, but when they can perform that validation before they do a thing, that's a phenomenally good way to allow people to, to sort of engage and you sort of remove those barriers. Um, so yeah, if I can just sort of show off a little bit about what it is that we do here. Mm. So <laughs> if I take a look, what we actually do, we have a repository that we sort of store all of our Ansible playbooks in, all the necessary credities for us to talk to Chef there. Um, we actually in store, we actually manage, um, there's a tool written by a, a, a colleague on my team that, that essentially hydrates all of your environment variables at runtime um, from YAML. It's called WithEnv, W-I-T-H-E-N-V. It's in PyPy. It's a wonderful way for us to, for me to say, by the way, go here and go chomp this YAML and hydrate a bunch of environment variables before you run whatever it is you're gonna run. So I can pass that stuff into those makefile targets or potentially like that Ansible runtime, right, and do the thing. So if I look at, Hmm. Right, I've got a bunch of, I'll hydrate all of these keys with these values. It's inherited, it's a, it's a really, really cool way for us to sort of manage. One of the things that we found is that managing dot files and expecting like your state to be what drives what you do, um, stuff blows up when you do that, right? By, be, by you being able to say like, no, I wanna be explicit in how I intend to set my environment before I run it, that's paid dividends. <laughs> So some of the stuff we do here, right, by, by, by passing everything through make, we're sort of managing all the, all the necessary bits for us to sort of manage chef, uh, manipulate sort of our, our Burks runtime, um, environment JSONs. Um, we have a bunch of stuff that we use to sort of create infrastructure out in Rackspace Public Cloud, clean it up, call it converge. Um, like everything you intend to do as you add new infra code, you, we sort of gate it through here and it's, it's, it's been awesome, right? Um, so the other thing that we do Um, talked about rub, rub and make files and all the things, right? We do it for our technical documentation too. Holy cow, this is probably one of the coolest things for you to take away from this talk in terms of us being able to, uh, for you to have something that you can take home to your org and like iteratively introduce uh, things that sort of make you move faster, quicker, but accurate. Um, this is wonderful. Anyone, the idea here is that anyone should be able to self-service to do a thing, right? And what we found over time is that by us putting that documentation of how to do the thing in a tool like Confluence, um, very much like SharePoint, wikis are where data goes to die, right? We never spend our time in there as developers or ops, and so we never curate it and we never care 
because it's in sort of a data store that we only go to when we need to pull data. So of course it's gonna get sort of wildly out of date, right? What we've actually done, um, because we're sort of an OpenStack-based project, um, everyone's reasonably familiar with Sphinx, right, and restructured text, but it really doesn't matter whatever it is you use. The key here is that we sort of put um, a docs deer of restructured text in the same repository where all that infra code is, right? What does that mean? Um, it means that as I introduce changes, remove features, whatever it is I do to that infra code to allow you to do a thing, provision infrastructure, deploy code, whatever, part of my patch or part of my pull request that my team peer reviews includes docs. This has been wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderful um, for a couple of reasons. One, onboarding is, technical onboarding is a reasonably solved problem at this point, right? In the sense that I can have a new team member provision authorization and access for them to get at that infra code repository, um, and they can just call make docs and like RTFM, and that's wonderful. Um, the other thing I'll say here too, my team is comprised of four developers, a QE person, myself as ops, and we have um, a dev manager, you know, product manager, and an ops manager. Of those technical contributors who aren't managers, we're batting a thousand for people who've contributed to technical documentation. Of two of those developers, they've been on the team less than a year, right? So they, and they've been able to contribute meaningful technical documentation as they've introduced or removed features to this infra code, which has been awesome. Um, so yeah, if I can sort of show this off right quick. It's been awesome. We good? So. Um, in that same repository, right? Um, I actually just call make docs, right? What does this do? This sort of describes everything it is that we do, right? So if it's three in the morning and stuff's on fire and you're on call, it's all there, right? And so we describe how CI works. We describe what it means for us to sort of build an environment, destroy it. We describe what it means for us to sort of manage infrastructure that's responsible for the environment working. Um, this has been awesome, right? I mean, so, um, and what that actually means just in this deer, we have a handful of restructured text that uh, is one, easy to read when you're diffing it, right? Because it's, like it's, it's humanly diffable, right? As opposed to a docx, confluence, whatever it is, and it's, it's part and parcel with all the infrastructure code, which is great. So yeah, docs, docs never seem interesting, but when they work, it's awesome. Um, the other thing I'll say too, um, <laughs> so Docker, right? Like we have a lot of people who are sort of interested in it. We have a lot of people who are sort of betting the farm on it and they're all in. What I'll say is this, describing to you the state that my team was in maybe a year ago, um, how do I get from here to there, right? So sort of what, what we've sort of agreed on or talked about as a team is like we should sort of lean into it where it makes sense, right? Um, where there's core competency or at, at the very least efficacy or somebody who wants to own the problem, okay, that's cool. Um, what we're not gonna do is like flush everything and like go all in on containers. We're gonna do it in a way that sort of makes sense and allows the team to continue to be high functioning, um, but allow us to realize some of those gains. So I've already shown a couple of places where um, we actually use containers, we use Docker as a way for us to get, get some quick wins, like testing those Jenkins jobs, right? When I have a, when somebody contributes a patch or a pull request to that YAML that drives CI, I, as a peer, can test that and, and validate that that stuff behaves the way it should behave by utilizing this tooling, right? Um, the other thing we do here too is that and build flows. Um, the other sort of stuff we've done here too that I think is really cool. Um, uh, six months ago, in, during, to during OpenStack Summit in Tokyo, uh, Rackspace announced Karina, which is like hosted Docker Swarm in the cloud, just works, bring, your, bring the same tooling you're used to to it, and it's awesome. Um, what I thought was really rad is that we had a, a dev on the team who was interested in Less than an hour of whacking around in Docker Compose, he got the stack running in Karina, which I think is really cool. Even though it's not part of our core functionality and we're not actually piping all CI through it necessarily, but it's there and it made sense for the team to go, yeah, that's great, awesome, let's, let's go ahead and sort of validate that. We use it as appropriately. And what we've seen now, six months later, is we're starting to see QE reuse that effort, right? Reuse those calories that were spent on, on, on doing this. Um, so that's, that's actually really, really cool. So do we use Docker in production? No, but will we someday? Maybe, I don't know, but use it where it makes sense. Um, the other thing I'll say too, um, a, a real recurring theme here is sort of make it really trivial for devs to engage in that infra code, right? If your build chain is hard, they're not gonna do it, right? They're, they're, they're short, at the very least, you've already lost with new team members you're trying to onboard, right? So whatever you can do to grease those wheels and make it easy for someone to get started or to validate a test, or val validate a patch that's in flight, that's awesome. Um, so make it, make it easy for you to validate all in-flight proposed changes. 
Um, there's some tooling that you can sort of deliberately choose here to help make that easier than harder. Um, if you utilize Chef at your shop for configuration management, um, you probably already use it, but if you don't, you should use Chef DK because it allows you to sort of have a runtime that can sort of run anywhere. And it allows CI to use it, allows the devs to use it, whatever that is, um, in a way that gives you a totally functional, you know, sort of Chef stack. You can run tests in Test Kitchen, it's great. I'll say the same thing for Ansible, right? The Omni TI people put together, uh, you know, a bunch of work into sort of trying to omnibus the Ansible runtime. And so there's an Ansible DK function if your team doesn't use Chef and use Ansible. Um, so look for, those, look for those tooling choices that allow you to sort of have wins that are great. Um, the other thing I'll say too, I've worked on some teams where um, those cookbooks or those playbooks that run Chef or Ansible maybe aren't in a place where dev can see or can't, aren't open by default to dev. You've already lost at that point, right? You should make it really easy for someone who wants to know how something works the way it works, be able to go look at it. Or even better, when they run into an issue with it, then being able to contribute a bug fix themselves. That's really, really valuable stuff. Um, so yeah, the only other thing I'll sort of say here too, um, be, deliberate, you be deliberate in your tooling choices, but also be deliberate in your workflow, right? If you make your workflow too hard, where it's wrappers on wrappers or scripts on scripts, then you're gonna swing the other direction where now you've overly complicated things to where your product team's gonna check out. So um, yeah. The other thing too, op operations people sort of go through trial by fire where they learn how to manage incidents appropriately, right? And some are good at it, some are not good at it, but whatever it is, that's just sort of a natural workflow when you're responsible for production to where you come to understand what it means to manage an incident. Your developers or your QE person probably doesn't know, and they're probably scared to death of what it means to manage it, right? So one of the things that I've seen work really, really well with my current product team is being able to manage incidents in the open. Um, rather than work out of phone bridges, can you work out of chat, right? If you need to rope in your incident management team, is there a way for you to do it in a way that, that allows your entire product team to have insight or visibility into that information exchange? Um, one of the most important things we can do as operators as our business grows is to be able to provide a timeline with impact that we can cascade out to leadership or technical stakeholders, right? If you can do that in the open, then other people, there's no reason why the rest of the people in your product team couldn't functionally take steps towards also being able to do that. So one of, the, one of the strategies we've done that I think has worked really, really well uh, for my product team within Rackspace is that we sort of have an incident management org. We're a 6,000-person org, $2 billion business. We, we have an incident management team who sort of triages incidents as they happen across product teams. And we sort of have a unique identifier per incident so that when this service has an issue, this service has an issue, I have something referential. What we do as a product team, well, the company also makes use of Etherpad, which is like Google Docs, uh, if, you, if you've ever used Google Docs before. One of the things we actually do, we sort of immediately get that marker, shove it into an etherpad, like that's the ID or that's the key that we're gonna use to manage this entire incident from. What this has done is this allows us to put that high level overview, that timeline, and we also put debug steps in there too. As the person who's responding goes through and checks A, checks B, validates that foo and bar are working, whatever that is, shove that in that etherpad, right? This allows for a couple of things, one, it lets people sort of know what's going on because nobody ever wants to be say t nobody ever wants to knock on your door or call you and be like hey what's 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 the scoop. Um, everybody should be able to pull information out of this this pad or this incident management pad and be able to understand what's going on. Um, the other thing that's valuable there too is if you have to rope out, there's all sorts of reasons why a person's going to need to walk away from a keyboard during an incident. Um, this allows the person who comes in after you to not duplicate a bunch of effort you've already done, right? So just default to oversharing, which can include your consoles. Like, don't worry about pasting fat finger commands into here. It's not about do you know all the flags to the binary to run the check. It's all about what have you done as an operator or as a member of the team to restore service. Um, the other thing that I'll say here too, I talked about that unique identifier. This is wonderful for plan maintenances too, right? When you have something that you've already worked through your, your, your organization with to sort of declare that you intend to undertake a plan maintenance, guess what? We have a unique identifier for that too within the org. So we do the same behavior, right? So that when anyone in the org says, hmm, the foo service is busted, let me go check on the state of the foo service. We'll actually declare in there the, the intent and the scope of what it is that we intend to introduce a change for. And then um, um, it can also be referential to sort of, if, if an incident does have to get called for that, it, it, it creates this wonderful workflow where we've seen other product teams, incident management, lots of other teams are like, that looks good. And they can sort of tune in without having to poke us when we're sort of working through an issue. Um, it's just been wonderful. Um, the other thing that's really important too is that um, you need to do everything you can do to make it really, really easy and trivial for your product team to be able to cascade pain up and out. Um, so for us, we participate in sort of a sprint-ish type role, like we work out of a backlog, but we don't necessarily work on a fixed sprint. We don't necessarily point everything you know, bit for bit like the manifesto tells you to do, but we sort of 
have these cadences where we get together every once in a while and we sort of check back, like, hey, how'd it go? Um, one of the things that's been really valuable is having sort of a persistent retrospective etherpad, right, to where if it's Tuesday afternoon or it's Friday at five or whatever it is, if some team member is experiencing pain with what it means for us to run this product, they need to be able to clearly document that. And the way that's referential for the team to get together after the fact and, and, and really sort of understand like, ah, it really did suck for Dick or Jane when they tried to do the foo function on Tuesday afternoon, right? Make it easy for that person to declare that so that you can carry that forward and review it as an org later. Um, the other thing I'll say too, make it really, really cheap to get stories in the backlog. As, as your use of JIRA grows over time, your, form, your field count grows, right? Do whatever you can do to fight against those mandatory field counts so that it's, at the very least, you can capture the essence of what that pain or that desire is there, and you can worry about massaging the, you know, the, the, the fields later. But do whatever you can do to not set, stack, the, stack the deck to where it's really hard for someone to get something in the backlog. Um, the other thing that's great, too, that I found has worked really well for my team, we're pretty reasonable when it comes for, to us pulling in stories into sprints as appropriate. Like when we're working something and we decide something is more priority than it should be, but we already started a sprint. It's okay, right? It's totally okay for us to sort of make a decision and have it be deliberate in what it is that we intend to do as a product team um, to sort of do the function or land the bug fix of what it is that we now consider to be high priority. It allows you to sort of be reasonable where everything's not a total moving target, but um, uh, things aren't sort of fixed and rigid to where you go, well, I can't, I can't do it till next sprint, right? It's somewhere in the middle is bad. Um, the other thing I'll say too, um, so. Failure is inevitable, right? And if you're an operator, like I was coming into this product team, like I know about sad path. The other people on this product team might not necessarily know that, right? And so I, I look at my role and what I sort of have intended to do over the last year is to sort of grow this concept within this product team of being able to identify failure reasonably early to help explain why it happened and to demonstrate how you can be deliberate and take steps to avoid it in the future. And that's really what it means to sort of be an operational expert or someone who has to you know, manage production, right? And being able to translate that to a team that understands it and also gets on board with, with um, supporting that idea is wonderful. So you can cultivate this culture sort of by leading by example. It's not so much that Nick fixed the thing, it's that Nick fixed the thing, here's how he fixed it, here's how he would have realized it was busted, here's what we're doing differently now that the, now that the thing, service is restored. Um, the other thing I'll say too, um, whatever your role is, because I've had conversations with some people where they say this will never work because I have compliance issues. And my response here is that no matter what, the deployment process should be clear across the team. Even if you don't have the keys to turn the lock to launch the missiles and deploy the code, that's fine. I can still separate that from you to where you can't do the thing if I have business reasons that compel me to not giving you the keys. But at the very least, you should all understand with how it works and how the bits all fit together to make things go from zero to 60. Um, um, if you don't have those compliance requirements, do whatever you can do to make it, do whatever you can do to be deliberate to allow potentially anyone in the org to deploy, right? Like whatever it can mean to sort of actually land a feature or a fix, you know, uh, all the way through to production. Um, the other thing I'll say too, is it's really, really important for you to establish this culture of trust. A year ago, it wasn't that anybody necessarily didn't trust each other, but if your deployments, your configuration management strategy is brittle or broken, like the team is not gonna engage as a whole, right? Those who are responsible for taking care of the thing will pay attention as appropriate, and that's about it, right? And so this Xanadu that I'm talking about now um, really can't really happen um, unless that, that tooling is, at the very least, um, not brittle, right? Um, so the other thing I'll say too is that even if your processes are manual, um, that's okay, right? Sort of the very first step here um, is to start slow. If you've got a bunch of manual processes, the best step is to document them and to find out where you can sort of introduce automation as appropriate that builds trust and generates value for the product team. Um, and so when, when your team trusts your tool chain, they'll contribute. Um, the other thing I'll say too, I, I sort of laid down the demographics of, of how the product team works here. Um, regardless of my story, your story, whatever, um, there's gonna be one or two people on your current product team now. Let, let's say you're, 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 totally, you're totally in the void, right? You, you're, Nick, I'm all alone. Nobody, nobody believes in the fight and the good fight. Of your product team, there's gonna be one or two people that you work with who actually want to believe, right? And I say want to believe, maybe they don't know how to believe. They've never seen how to believe, whatever that is. So the key takeaway here, I think, is for you as an individual contributor on your product team to be able to go home, identify those one to two people, um, and establish some quick rapport with them, right? Get them on board, have them understand with where it is you sort of want the business to go, have them understand that value. 
Once you've got those one to two assets working for you sort of as promoters, you've influenced them in a way that gets them on board and they're, they're willing to fight the good fight with you, um, now you're not just one person, right? And so now there's two to three of you. Um, those people on your team who maybe were disengaged and didn't care, maybe they weren't necessarily detractors, but they, they didn't, maybe they also didn't know, but they also don't care enough to want to be a promoter. Um, you've got multiple people working on your team now towards fight and fight. Um, it becomes a little bit easier for you to flip those neutral parties, right? Um, and to get them on board. And sort of when all you're left with is detractors then, um, it doesn't matter. You've already got critical mass here. You're already sort of making these iterative measurable quick wins. And so um, they really can't stop you. And if they're truly digging their heels in and stopping you, um, uh, yeah, they'll, you'll wor work with your management in a way to sort of prioritize things to allow sort of the train to not stop within the station. So I, I, hope, I hope what I gave you was some tangible takeaways. You know, it's wonderful that I followed after Nathan because um, this is sort of what a lot of little tiny chunks of things that people can do to take them back to sort of their product teams and to start doing right away within sort of day one, week one, month one, whatever that is. Um, so even if you're one, one operator in a sea of developers, um, it's totally possible, right? You can do this. Um, so even if your team is highly dysfunctional, right? There's ways that you can take advantage of maybe some of the strategies talked about in here to allow you to sort of iteratively chip away at that brokenness, right? Sort of build, build small, measurable chunks of trust with your champions, and you can actually do it. And it's funny that Nathan chose uh, the Jesse Robbins quote, because that's how I end this talk, is uh, whatever you do, go home, don't fight stupid, make more awesome. Uh, it's a wonderful way for you to go about doing what you need to do in order to help transform, transform your product team to be a really, really high-functioning unicorn. So that's it, that's all I got. I told you you had a lot of good advice. Uh, make sure you Get your backpacks. Don't leave them in here. 